Hello. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Good to see you all this afternoon. To you. Who's here? How's everybody's Friday going? Oh, there we go. Good. It's a pretty day. Wow. Shanti and I were just outside on our labyrinth patio trying to figure out how we're going to do seating for the Earth Day service. So that's fun to have something real. Not that this isn't real, but something in person to look forward to. Yeah. Nate, how many people do you think will be able to come? That's the question. I think, um, I think if there were 25 who signed up, we could seat everyone. We would just, you know, do rows further and further back. Yeah. Um, Good. But yeah, I don't, so I don't think I'm going to put a cap on the, the max capacity. We'll just see how RSVP. Mm -hmm. And if it's smaller, you know, if it's only like eight or 10 people, we could actually all sit on the deck, which would be pretty nice. That would be nice. Um, really intimate. Mm -hmm. If it's bigger, then we'll, we'll sit kind of on that labyrinth space, mm -hmm. which will be nice too. It's just, you'll be in the sun. So yeah. You'll need to, you'll need a sun hat. Do you think it could sort of wrap around to the Arlington, more to the Arlington side as well? Uh, I'm not quite sure how to picture that. Um, sorry, you mean like closer to the sidewalk? Well, yeah, kind of like a in a semicircle or a big arc. So there's probably only two rows or maybe three on the walkway side, but then more, maybe more on the other. So I it'll be on the it'll be on the labyrinth, the patio area. Okay, so you're thinking of okay. It it won't be on the sidewalk. No, no, I'm not yeah. talking about sidewalk. There's a big wide walkway in front of the main doors that goes down into the oh patio. sure yeah yeah that's the space i was thinking about you know the whole thing i thought you were just looking along the social hall outside and there is a uh podium area at the at the deck and audience area towards the labyrinth only that's what i was thinking you were okay perspective you were using yeah if you it's hard to talk about this without looking so if you want to come maybe yeah. uh the the week of um uh, you're welcome to I'm sure you, i'm sure you and shanti were thinking a lot of the same lines i'm speaking <laughs> probably yeah <laughs> uh hi sarah hello everybody hey hi. hey you so I know uh, a few people couldn't join us today, but they wanted me to record. Um, so they're going to watch later on. Um, so we'll ju we'll jump in. I think um, we have a really good mix of poems again from uh, Nick and Susan, and I added a few myself. And we have at least two poems where we have the recording uh, of the poet reading. So that's always fun nice. as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And, and we'll, I think we'll start with this one. And Susan, this is yours, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And, um, and we have the recording of this one. So sh should I just go ahead and play that? Sure, sounds good. And then you can, you can lead us into a little discussion of it. OK. OK. This is Allison Hawthorne Deming, and I'm reading my poem, Resurrection. My friend, a writer and scientist, has retreated to a monastery where he has submitted himself out of exhaustion to not knowing. 
He's been thinking about the incarnation, a.k.a. Big Bang, after hearing a monk's teaching that crucifixion was not the hard part for Christ. Incarnation was. How to squeeze all of that, all of that into a body. I woke that Easter to think of the Yaki celebrations taking place in our city, the culminating ritual of the Gloria, when the disruptive spirits with their clacking daggers and swords are repelled from the sanctuary by women and children throwing cottonwood leaves and confetti. And then my mother rose in me, rose from the anguish of her hospice bed, a woman who expected to direct all the action, complaining to her nurse, I've been here three days and I'm not dead yet. Not ready at 102 to give up control, even to giving up control. I helped with the morphine clicker. Peace, peace peace, the stilling at her throat, the hazel eye, become a glassy marble. Yet here she is, an Easter irreverent, still rising to dress in loud pastels and turn me loose in Connecticut woods to hunt my basket of marshmallow eggs, jelly beans, and chocolate rabbit. There, fakeries of nature made vestal incarnated in their nest of shiny manufactured grass. Any reactions? Wow. Yeah. So this was published just a few years ago, I think. Yes, it, I think it's maybe from 2016, so it's very, very contemporary. What's, wow. what's, what stood out? Uh, I'm sorry, who was speaking? I just said, wow, this is Susan, oh. the other Susan. The other Susan. <laughs> yeah. I, I was I, knocked I, over with the line um, that the hard part is the incarnation. Yes. I've always thought that. Mm that the hardest part of it all is being alive and being attentive. Mm -hmm. I thought it was intriguing to link the Big Bang with incarnation. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a connection that I ever heard before. And, that, and I think that's the thing that I appreciated the most about this poem is the connections that it made that were fresh to me, like that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I uh, just for particular reason the yaki part struck me because I I had a friend who who uh, taught for a while in, in Mexico in, the, in that area I think she was outside Guaymas and she said that on Good Friday the services in the church and the procession with the clacking uh, mm. and she this is uh, my friend is not a particularly spiritual person she said you could just feel that there was something happening, something beyond. It was so mm -hmm. uh, ghostly. Mm -hmm. And then the, because of the, the fun thing about these poems is it inspires you to Google a little bit and find out more about it. And the Yaki were, they were invited the Jesuits to, to teach them and they incorporated Christian religion in with their spirit. Uh, so, this part of the poem that talked about something beyond, I thought was, was striking. Mm -hmm. But I agree, I, the, the, the resurrection, this whole, uh, the whole theme of this weekend, it seems, has been it's hard. The incarnation is hard. And uh, that going from an Easter to a time when you have to go back into the world is hard. Mm -hmm. I thought this poem really dramatized that. Yeah. And we're, we're going to, that's a theme that actually came up in a few of the poems that got sent to me today. So we'll have a chance to sort of explore that as it's repeated. Um, it I love the, oh, go ahead, Eleanor. I was just going to say that that same part uh, about the crucifixion was not the hard part, but the incarnation was made me think about um, 
getting locked down at the first day of the pandemic wasn't hard. It was not hard at all because it just happened. One day we were free and one day we weren't. But the going back out into the world is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, I think we all feel that. That's a great connection. We're, we're all living that right now with, right. you know, not being sure how much to wear a mask, even if we're fully vaccinated and yeah. I'm interested in these lines. I don't know if you can see me highlight them, but yeah. and then my mother rose in yeah. me, rose from the anguish of her hospice bed, a mm -hmm. woman who expected to direct all the action, complaining to her nurse, I've been here three days and I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and I like the way the language kind of intensifies there. Like it's pretty prosy, uh, um, informal before that, but then, you know, there's a lack of punctuation and it really kind of gets very urgent there, doesn't it? And I like how she goes on, you know, not willing to give up control, even the control yeah. to give up control. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. That's a tough woman. <laughs> it, I, I will say this: those lines made me think of my mother. Really, really. <laughs> and then, what do we make of the next line? I helped with the morphine clicker. Mm -hmm. I I thought she meant she helped her mother die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, click. Peace, peace, peace. Yeah. You know, it's, it seems so, like such an obvious observation, but, but of course, the resurrection of the mother is in this poet, you know, her, her mother lives on in her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, I, that's another connection that I had not thought of making, you know, as this is just another interpretation of resurrection. Yeah. 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 And, and they, here she is. Right. <laughs> Yeah, the comment, I've been here three days and I'm not dead yet. It's <laughs> a contemporary way of putting the whole resurrection story in one contemporary sentence, I think. Yeah. Out of the tomb, not dead yet. <laughs> How long do I have to be here? Three days, great. <laughs> I like that part. <laughs> I don't understand why she ended with Easter baskets and fakeries of nature. That is that to contrast with the reality, the ultimate reality of the other stuff. I just, what do you think? I thought it was that she was going back in the memory when her mother was dressing in wild pastels and did what all mothers do, hide the Easter eggs out in the woods. And so she's with her mother who's dying, but she has a, a memory of Easter and resurrection that's, that's comes very alive in her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm still thinking about that last sentence too, because at first I read it like the, like the speaker is carrying on the mother's ways by you know dressing up for Easter. But then it says, and turn me loose, you know? So if, so mm -hmm. that makes me think it's more like Julie's reading of it, right? Cause mm -hmm. unless it, I don't know, maybe it's a sort of both and. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the ending is, is complicated. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, it sort of relies on these fake, you know, fake images, and she even says fakeries of nature, um, which, which I guess suggests that we, we, <laughs> well, suggests what? It, it's, it's sort of like we, we create this fake version of nature to celebrate Easter and for some weird reason. And this is the thing that really stands out in her mind as she remembers her childhood. Yeah, marshmallow she eggs jelly beans chocolate <laughs> rabbits all fakeries of nature mm -hmm. yeah and, and then, then the grass incarnated yeah. in there yeah okay. yeah made vestal incarnated in their nest of shiny manufactured grass 
what does she mean made vestal? Well, is that is that to create some kind of a not sacramental sacrament? All I'm making the connection with is vestal virgins. Yeah, <laughs> you know, which were temporal caretakers or whatever, I guess. Yeah, it's um, I, I almost read that as like made holy or made mm. made sacred or set apart in some way. Mm -hmm. Are these childish uh, memories somehow made holier in her memory now of her mother? Oh, yeah. that's nice. That's yeah, I like that too. Yeah, that's what that, yeah, incarnated is. Mm -hmm. it was, when she was a child, an Easter egg was an Easter egg, but now it's a lot more when she remembers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's... you're saving it for me, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> that was yeah. a clear ending. But and that's the about... that's the poem. Sorry. I'm sorry, two of us were talking. Go ahead, Eleanor. Oh, I just said I loved the poem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she, she does make the comment in there before the ending, I was thinking. Here she is, an Easter irreverent, still rising. Mm -hmm. Still mm -hmm. rising, yeah. You don't forget. Yes, yes. And she's going to celebrate Easter the way you're supposed to celebrate it, which is by, you know, making this basket full of fake grass and putting eggs and yeah. jelly beans in it. You know, she's going to do that. But when you're a parent doing it for a child, it's almost uh, uh, a ritual. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly for her an analogy that her mother taught her. Mm -hmm. And she's now applying to something deeper, I guess. Yeah. Huh. I mean, don't we do that with Santa Claus? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's what we do with memory. Ah, uh, yeah. But well, if, you, if you go back to the idea of the incarnation, it's like God coming into this sort of muddy, messy, often tacky existence, right? <laughs> and um, injecting it with light and meaning. And that's almost what happens here. It's like these, you know, these very, you know, tacky commercial ways that we have of commemorating Jesus's birth and the resurrection uh they somehow still mean right they somehow still matter um exactly. but yeah i thought that was lovely i thought that yeah. was lovely yeah and, and do, don't don't we all feel that so vividly and you can just see the color of the jelly beans and you can see the green of the fake grass and you can see the the loud pastels, which all of us had, all of us women here on the call had to wear as kids <laughs> when, we, when we went to church on Easter. It's just so full of, you know, just so vivid and real. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's keep going. Um, thanks so much for that one, Susan. Yes. I'm, I, I have to say goodbye, but I was glad to drop in even just for one poem. Oh, oh. See you guys soon. Bye, See Sarah. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Thanks for coming. So, Nick, this one's yours. Okay. Icon, The Harrowing of Hell by Denise Levertov. Down through the tomb's inward arch, he is shouldered out into limbo to gather them dazed from dreamless slumber. The merciful dead, the prophets, the innocents, just his own age and those unencumbered, unnumbered others waiting here, unaware, in an endless void he is ending now, stooping to tug at their hands, to pull them from their sarcophagi, dazzled, almost unwilling, didmus, neighbor in death, Golgotha dust still streaked on the dried sweat of his body, no one had washed and anointed, is here, for sequence is not known in limbo, the promise given from cross to cross at noon arches beyond sunset and dawn. All these he will swiftly lead to the paradise road. They are safe. That done, there must take place that struggle no human presumes to picture. Living, dying, descending to rescue the just from shadow where lesser travails than this. To break through earth and stone of the faithless world. 
back to the cold sepulcher, tear-stained, stifling shroud, to break from them back into breath and heartbeat and walk the world again, closed into days and weeks again, wounds of his anguish open, and spirit streaming through every cell of flesh, so that if mortal sight could bear to perceive it, it would be seen his mortal flesh was lit from within now and aching for home. He must return first in divine patience and no hunger again and give to humble friends the joy of giving him food, fish, and a honeycomb. Mm. Well, and comments. It's sort of, again, like the idea of the heart, the death is not the hard part, the incarnation was the hard part. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was remarkable how this theme showed up in our poems, it showed up in the services, it showed up in the prayer that uh, on Good Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, the hard part is yet to come. It's very different from Christ is risen, we are saved and he ascends into heaven. Yeah. Hmm. I like the um, earthiness of it. What the, is the picture? The, the pulling Didmus from his tomb, mm -hmm. streaked, unwashed, and dazed, and sends him on his way to heaven. And the almost ironic tone that done, now the mm -hmm. heart hurts. He hustles them off there on their way, but that's not his primary job right now. That's not his big worry. Mm -hmm. Let's go back into the world. Yeah, nobody ever talks about what goes what went on during those three days, do they? And this is sort of a picture of that. Yeah. <clears throat> the limbo. Limbo. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Right. A lot to do. <laughs> yeah. What do you think of the last line? I puzzled over that. Um, and to give to humble friends the joy of giving him food, fish, and a honeycomb. Mm -hmm. I liked that part. Okay. I liked the giving of others, the giving, uh, how can I say it? The giving of the opportunity for others to give him joy. Mm -hmm. the, reciprocality um, that mm -hmm. Jesus would receive as well as give. And the way it's phrased is. Yeah. is mm -hmm. that, uh, that meeting by the Sea of Galilee the next, that early morning when they'd all, all gone back fishing and he appears with a, with a campfire and fish. Mm -hmm. And part mm -hmm. of his, reun his reunion with them was preparing a meal and sitting with them on the beach. And that was a, in the in the scripture they're talking about. He had bread and some fish. Yeah. And that just really reminds me of the feeding of the five thousand, that kind of thing. You know, where in miniature Forgive they me. get to practice their ministry. I guess it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like the gift of food to him is is to make up for how he has to know hunger again. Mm -hmm. Again, the incarnation is the hard part. And I wonder <laughs> if the giving of food didn't imply that the even as much as you've done this unto me, you have done it unto mm -hmm. someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always like this poem. Yeah, it's beautiful. There's something sort of of um, rich about the honeycomb, you know, ending with the honeycomb because it's such yeah. a, a an image of 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 um, sweetness and aliveness, yeah. and sort of a you know you know it's something you would have for a treat, yeah. and something you might give somebody to cheer them up almost. Yeah. I Googled the sim Christian symbolism of honeycomb. And uh, one, of course, is the honeycomb, the word of God that's mentioned in the Psalms. Uh, and another one was the cells of the honeycomb that need to be filled with, uh, with righteousness. Mm. 
I just don't, I don't know if that applied in this poem or not, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. honeycomb appears in the, in the scriptures a lot, doesn't it? Well, it's the one hint in this poem too, that, you know, this mortal life might bring anguish, but it, there's something sweet about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think of it in a sense as kind of a reverse of communion where Jesus is breaking the bread or giving fish to you know his disciples, I give you my body. And they mm -hmm. instead are giving him the joy of giving him the food, which shows an incredible <laughs> reciprocity that's very beautiful, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by going back, he's making this reciprocity possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. After he'd been abandoned and had been crucified. Nick, could you please explain the title? I'm puzzled over that too. An icon, of course, is a static figure. It's painted. It's a Greek uh, or it's an Orthodox image. And I, as I recall, there's not, never any motion in it. The figures are stat static and settled and benign and, and unmoved. Mm -hmm. And this is just the opposite. And there's, there's a bit of irony in all through her poem, I think, uh, down to that line. Because the harrowing of hell in her picture is not a static icon. It's movement. And if you read it out loud, as I tried to do, I, I stumbled over the ends of sentences because they don't come. It rushes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. It rushes, and it's exactly the opposite of a static picture of a divine Christ doing this, you know. I always thought icons, as I used them, were ways and w windows to God, that we kind of merged with them and moved through them into God's presence. And maybe that's what she meant. Yeah. You know, I have to say, when I first saw this, it kind of brushed over the, oh, that's the title. I yeah. thought it was Ikea at first. I just gave myself a big laugh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like uh, Julie's idea of the window. Mm -hmm. And I know, um, so Denise Levertov, um, I believe she was raised, or at least she's, she was half Jewish. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then didn't she convert to either Catholicism or Anglican, you know, Episcopalianism? Yeah, I think she was Episcopal. Uh, was it Episcopal? That's what I have in my brain, but I don't know. My brain gets one confused. of those one of those higher church, you know, yeah. traditions yeah. that uses icons. But uh, she wrote a lot of religious poetry. Oh yeah, and poetry of protest too. Yeah, and she lived here for a while. Yeah, mm. she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful poet. I think this is just has so much um, depth. Um, you read it well, I, I thought, but there's just so much, you're right, it's, there's, I'm almost exhausted by the end. Yeah, there's a rush <laughs> to it, isn't there? But yeah. it, and it quiets at the end with that lovely line, fish and honeycomb, mm -hmm. to, receive, to give them the pleasure of giving him. Mm -hmm. The pleasure of serving Christ mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the world through him. True. No, you're right, Susan. It is exhausting, though, isn't it? It's just, <laughs> it's hard to so, read, I feel like. Yeah. yeah. So many emotions and like almost every couple of lines, you've got a whole nother wrenching thought you know mm. anguish come back to breath just on and on <laughs> yes, struggle <laughs> tear stained you know just ooh. yeah which again makes your point that the incarnation is the hard part mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and the and the duties there unto pertaining <laughs> <laughs> well, Nate, you had an interesting comment about the parallel with Aeneas. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. 
So in the Aeneid, uh, one of my favorite parts is in book six, where Aeneas, so Aeneas's father dies, and he wants to go see him in the underworld. And he goes and he sees this, um, uh, like an oracle, the, the Cumaean Sibyl, uh, like a seer. And she says, it's easy to go down. It, like, you can do it. You can make it down to the underworld. But the hard part will be after you see your father to come back up into your life. That mm -hmm. will be the, the work. That will be your task. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's similar, right? Going back into the everyday, going back into your body, you know, after a sort of mountaintop experience. Mm -hmm. That's what's hard. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting parallel, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like those stories you hear about people that have near-death experiences, you know, who float above their own bodies and, you know, going towards the light and all of that. And they're sorry that they have to go back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Really. Um, okay, let's let's keep going. We have a we have a big contrast now, I think, from a, a really intense pious poem to this this one that I chose um, by a poet named James Schuyler. And it's a little bit longer. I think it's like two and a half pages. Um, but again, lots of description. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about it symbolically, really. He just sort of writes what he sees. And it's almost like a stream of consciousness kind of thing. But he does get to some big questions um, about heaven. Um, and you could even say resurrection by the end. So I have no idea if anybody's going to like this one, but we'll see. And, and here, here's him reading this. A man in blue, under the French horns of a November afternoon, a man in blue is raking leaves with a wide wooden rake whose teeth are pegs, or rather dowels. Next door, boys play soccer. You got to start over, sort of. A round attic window in a radiant gray house waits like a kettle drum. You got to start. The Brahmsian day lapses from waltz to march. The grass, rough cropped as Bruno Walter's hair, is stretched, strewn, and humped beneath a sycamore wide and high as an idea of heaven in which Brahms turns his face like a bearded thumb and says, there is something I must tell you to Bruno Walter. <laughs> In the first movement of my second, think of it as a family planning where to go next summer in terms of other summers, a material ecstasy, subdued, recollective. Bruno Walter in a funny jacket with a turned up collar says, let me sing it for you. He waves his hands and through the vocalese shaped spaces of naked elms, he draws a copper beach ignited with a few late leaves. He bluely glazes a rhododendron, a sea of leaves against gold grass. There is a snapping from the bright work of parked and rolling cars. There almost has to be a heaven, so there could be a place for Bruno Walter, who never needed the cry of a baton. Immortality in a small, dusty, rather gritty, somewhat scratchy magnifox, from which a forte drops like a used Brillo pad. <laughs> Frayed. But it's hard to think of the sky as a thick glass floor with thick soled Viennese boots tromping about on it. It's a whole lot harder thinking of Brahms in something soft, white, and flowing. <laughs> Life, he cries, here in the last movement, is something more than beer and Skittles. And the something more is a whole lot better than beer and Skittles, says Bruno Walter, darkly under the sod. I don't suppose it seems so dark to a root. Who are these men in evening coats? What are these thumps? Where is Brahms and Bruno Walter? Ensconced in resonant plump easy chairs covered with scuffed brown leather 
in a pungent autumn that blends leaf smoke, sycamore, tobacco, other. Their nobility wound in the finality, finale, like this calico cat asleep, curled up in a bread basket on a sideboard where the sun falls. Mm. So I don't, I have to admit, I don't even know who Bruno Walter is. He's a, he's a conductor. Yeah. I think that best known. Yeah. Yeah. Although he, I, I think he was also a composer, but I don't know anything about the music that he wrote. Yeah. So who never needed the cry of a baton. Right. Yeah. And that's like a whole thing, you know, where some conductors use a baton and some don't. Right. And it's right. sort of like a position you take, you know, whether you have one or not. Yeah. So when been. did he live? Um, he, I don't know. He's 20th century, I think. Yeah, he's 1950s. You can hear him conducting Brahms' second symphony on mm -hmm. uh, that is a classic recording. Oh, what yeah. Is, yeah. What is that wireless thing we get, you know, on our internet? We get music. I can't think of the name of it. Eleanor, what is that called? Um, Sonify or something like that. Yeah, Sonify. Anyway, I found Bruno oh. conducting Brahms' second symphony. And if you listen to it while you read the poem, that helps. <laughs> oh. you hear the waltz changing to the march, and you hear the trump, and you hear the, uh, the definite statement at the end. Mm. Mm. But it was a classic wow. recording. He, he was active in the 50s, 60s. Okay. And Brahms was uh, 100 years before. 19th century. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. He yeah. was an interpreter of Brahms. Right. Right. So they wouldn't have talked to each other in real life, but this poem life, no, but across the centuries. starts to imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just I, I love the uh, the whole premise of this, imagining these two artists talking to each other and then um, their music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the way he gets to this actual like theological speculation, you know, there almost has to be a heaven. Uh -huh. so there could be a place for Bruno Walter who <laughs> never needed the cry of a baton. Yeah. And you can't see Brahms in flowing robes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I love that part. I, I, I liked how in the beginning was so sort of pedestrian almost, a guy's raking leaves, you know, there's a soccer game going on. And then it just sort of builds to this transcendent picture. Yeah. I got this picture because he was wearing a blue shirt and I think that's a French peasant blouse is typically blue isn't it in traditional yeah. art and his rake has pegs in it like a like a French rake that you see in paintings and uh, I couldn't see why he had you know immediately I had this picture of a French countryside but it wasn't that it was probably New York huh? Mm -hmm. yep yeah, yeah probably uh, or, or Maine or something so, you know mm -hmm. some somewhere New Englandy where where yeah. Tyler was. Um, well, a concert hall, actually. Huh. I like the sentence in here. Immortality in a small, dusty, rather gritty, somewhat scratchy magnavox. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was. And really, you know, in so maybe immortality is kind of in the eye of the beholder in some ways. Yeah. But he's uh, probably he's hearing the scratchy record, is he, while he's lying on the grass, mm -hmm. coming from someone's house, maybe from that Victorian house with a round window. <laughs> sure, yeah. could be, could but, be. Uh, like you say, Susan, the, the leap to immortality is uh, is interesting. Well, well and you sort of get a feeling of of immortal faded immortality. I mean, th this old mm -hmm. record, and you know, as time goes on, it's just going to sound worse and worse. Yeah, I, I got the impression of a sandwich. You know, the heaven above with above the glassy ceiling. He kind of ruled that out because he couldn't imagine Brahms in fluffy white clothes, mm -hmm. and underneath, with the in the dark with the soil. You know, the roots were there, so they're 
you know, these two couldn't interact, which means it sort of has to be here between whatever the heaven is and whatever the decomposing in the earth is, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I like that, Julie. That's really nice. Yeah. Which kind of brings us back to, to this earth, right? To this existence. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just thinking in very earthy terms, this whole thing, you know, I, I guess I'm picturing kind of a, some kind of an old Viennese concert hall where people are playing these rich but old music. Then this hall in the end, life, he cries here in the last movement, is something more than beer and Skittles. That's mm -hmm. Brahms saying that. And we'll, Bruno Walter agrees. And the something more is a whole lot better. And then who are these men in evening coats? You know, kind of the composer almost recognizing the listener. It just mm. was such an intriguing set of back and forth, back and forth, or in the music, in the, re in the listening to the music. Am I mm -hmm. making it, hearing it, becoming it, or just observing? You know, it just is kind of this, I don't know, mm. back and forth. <laughs> Another thing I liked is the images he has at the end, which are all comfort images to me. Mm -hmm. Me too. So he's ending with, with, with visions that should make us feel comfortable. I mean, a cat, you know, and a, curled up in a bread basket. It's such a, I don't know, cats like that, so comforting. Mm. Yeah. So peaceful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It quiets down at the end, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're right, like the other one. Huh. Under the French horns. The symphony opens with French horns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what's getting, that's sending you off on a wild goose chase, Nick, to then you started thinking about everything French. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> what happens. Yeah. <laughs> it's French rakes the whole bit, then I. Right. <laughs> yeah, and it's fun to imagine. I mean, we don't know, right? But maybe the poet listened to that piece before he started writing, or maybe maybe he came up with a metaphor of the French horns of a November afternoon first, and then that got him thinking about that might be the other way Bruno around. And Bruno Walter. Um, and then really the poem is just this sort of ode to the imagination, right? The way in mm -hmm. which if you're really just kind of free in your thinking and daydreaming you can get to some amazing places yeah that is almost a manifestation of immortality or heaven or something the way in which people can live in your inner life mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and, and it just it creating that that ending you know where is Brahms and Bruno Walter ensconced in resonant plump easy chairs covered with scuffed brown leather in a pungent autumn that blends leaf smoke sycamore tobacco other their nobility wound in a finale like this calico cat asleep curled up in a bread basket on a sideboard where the sun falls mm. Mm. Really this, this, lovely this, this world is not conclusion the species lies beyond invisible as music but positive as sound <laughs> I don't remember how Brahms second ends, but it sounds like, see their nobility wound in a finale like this Calico Cat. It sounds like it could be one of those really gentle, quiet endings. Mm -hmm. Like this cat. I don't remember either. Yeah. So <laughs> ordinary. Anyway, it's a wonderful, complex poem. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, can, Nick, Nate, can you tell us about the poet? Yeah, sure, a little bit. Um, so I think last time, Nick, didn't you bring in a poem by Ann Porter? Um, or maybe two times ago. Anyway, so um, so so James Schuyler was uh, really good friends with this painter, Fairfield Porter. They were oh, yeah, both, yeah, right. both sort of part of like the New York school. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've heard of like, as a, a poet, Frank O'Hara, but painters like, you know, Willem de Kooning, um, Jackson Pollock, um, the painters were a little bit first and then the poets and um, 
so Skyler was sort of part of that. Uh, he lived in the Chelsea Hotel uh, mm. in, in Manhattan and never could hold down a job as an adult and was just fortunate enough to have some friends who supported him. And he actually, he moved into the house of Fairfield Porter. And mm -hmm. uh, I think they were actually in a relationship and um, basically he stayed there for like 30 years. <laughs> I don't know how that worked, um, but you know, the artists all the time, it, you know, they sort of make it work until it doesn't anymore. So what, did he know the abstract impressionist painting painters? Yeah, and he wrote like Frank O'Hara and Schuyler both wrote a lot of art criticism. Okay. So you can tell how much Schuyler likes description. So yeah. all his poems mm -hmm. are full of, and they'll often just start off like this, where he's just telling you what he's seeing, like out the window. It's very nonchalant. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, it's very hard to imitate as a writer. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He somehow does it in his own way. A Man in Blue sounds like the title of a painting, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it does. Did it, did anybody else think that maybe, I mean, as I'm reading it today, it almost sounds like a dialogue between Brahms and the conductor, Bruno Walter. Just, you know, Brahms starts it off with the French horns and maybe the conductor is thinking that reminds him of a November in, afternoon etc you know and then pretty soon the the conversation gets pretty pretty deep <laughs> um i don't know i've just i've watched um oh cred now you, when you can't think of a name um the san francisco conductor come on everybody uh, michael philson thomas uh, yes thank you <laughs> and when he is you know, I watched him on TV and when he's conducting, he is dancing and expressing yeah. the thing that he is conducting, you know, and the, and the instruments are dancing with him. It's just such an interesting way to convey a message in, a, in, in music, the way you convey. And here is a poet trying to put all of that into words this interesting dance. I don't know. That's just one of the thoughts I've had as I've, as we've all been talking. Mm. Well, thanks for humoring me with this one. Everybody. No, I like this one. Me too. I like good. it. Yeah. Good. Let's keep going. We got some other good ones. Um, Susan, this was yours. Do you want yes. to read yes. it? This will be a little easier. <laughs> oh, I think this is fun to try to figure out. <laughs> this, is a nice, this is a nice simple one. Easter blessing, David White. The blessing of the morning light to you. May it find you even in your invisible appearances. May you be seen to have risen from some other place we intuit and know in the darkness and that carries all we need. May you see what is hidden in you as a place of hospitality and shadowed shelter. May that hidden darkness be your gift to give. May you hold the shadow to the light and the silence of that place to the word of the light. May you join all of your previous disappearances with this new appearance. Another Zoom poetry <laughs> by Dick. This new morning, this being seen again, new and newly alive. It's nice. Really nice. Mm -hmm. It starts out sounding like an Irish blessing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I sort of appreciate the, the straightforwardness of this. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's very sort of classic um, language about Easter, um, but, but it still has some really fresh takes about I like the shadows, the shadowed shelter and turning the shadow to the light. And, and I don't think those are images you, usually that's more of a Christmas thing. Yeah. You don't usually hear those sorts of images associated with Easter. 
This is uh, the middle of it, though. It's provocative. May you see what is hidden in you as a place of hospitality and shadowed shelter. And may that hidden darkness be your gift to give. I love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. me too. Certainly characterizing a place of shadow as a very um, uh, generous, but not, you know, often shadows are characterized as scary and yeah. you know, depending on evil even. And this mm -hmm. seems like they're characterizing shadow as more creative and constructive and healing almost even. Mm -hmm. Kind yeah. of a What are the thoughts about that hidden darkness? That's where your treasure is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. What about, may you join all your previous disappearances with this new appearance? That's about a, re a resurrection or a change of renewal. But it, uh, you know, one thing I liked about it was there were many, you know, previous yeah. disappearances. I uh -huh. like the plural of that. <laughs> yeah. Coming and going, coming and going. Mm -hmm. I, I like the, the image of a shadowed shelter. I mean, the, the idea that it can't be shadowed unless there's light somewhere, even though we see it as darkness. Mm -hmm. If it's shadowed, there has to be a light, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And if it's shelter, it has to be dark. In a yeah. Way. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Kind of like a tent where you can cool from the heat. Mm -hmm. Hospitality in, in a shelter from the winds of life. I don't know, something like that. Huh. Huh. Susan, do you see that previous disappearances as... Um, I mean, it's hard to know the valence of disappearance in the context of the poem because you could read it positively, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could read it as like disappearing into this sheltered, dark place. Um, but when I first read the poem, I read that in a more kind of conventional like disappearance as a sort of, you know, failure or shortcoming. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that reading too where, you know, if you do read it as a negative thing, um, you know, it's the, I guess the way in which like all the things that didn't quite go well for you in the past still make you who you are or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You still, have, you still have a new chance. Right, right. It, also, I, it made me think of, of the times that you're just sort of like not present in your own life that you just sort of disappear away from projects, people, places, you know, whatever is going on. But at yeah. some point you have to step forward again. Mm -hmm. It's part of the renewal. Like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That connects to the first several lines too, actually. Morning, yeah. Guys may it find you even in your invisible appearances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts about this one? Well, it's a more complicated poem than it looks at first. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think so too, yeah. Well, creation certainly happens in the dark. True, mm -hmm. yeah. That's for sure. It's a nice poem. I really like it. I like it a lot. I like David White a lot. This would be a good one to use in a church service, I feel yeah. like. Yeah, mm -hmm. it would. Some poems just aren't right for that, for whatever reason, but this one really would be. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I like having it, listening to it, but also reading it so I could kind of mull it over. As If I just was listening to it, I'm not sure. I would have followed it so well necessarily, mm -hmm. at least not the first time through. Right. Yeah. Huh. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
So we have two left. Uh, both are pretty short, so maybe we can at least spend a few minutes on each one. Um, Nick. Yeah. The year of the goldfinches. I googled goldfinches as a symbol. And uh, these are the little birds that as Christ was crowned with thorns. I don't know if anybody knows the story. I didn't know it. Hmm. The little birds, that, as Christ was crowned with thorns, the little birds flew down to pluck the thorns away. And in uh, doing so, they received some of the blood of Christ on their heads. So the European goldfinch is like our goldfinch, only it has a little spot of red on its head. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol in, that appears in Renaissance paintings, particularly of the, res the Christ child is holding a goldfinch. Mm -hmm. And it's a symbol of resurrection. There are many, many in Greek iconography and Renaissance Western portraits. And there's one where, where John, the infant John and the infant Christ are playing with a goldfinch. Anyway, I think that's where she got the poem. Hmm. There were two that hung and hovered by the mud puddle and the musk thistle, flitting from one sp splintered fence post to another, bathing in the rainwater's glint like it was a mirror to some other universe where things were more acceptable, easier than the place I lived. I'd watch for them. The bright peacocking male, low walk female on each morning walk, days spent digging for some sort of elusive answer to the question my curving figure made. Later, I learned that they were a symbol of resurrection. Of course they were. My two yellow winged twins feasting on thorns and liking it. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's nice. It's mm. very nice. Yeah. So what do we make of feasting on thorns and liking it? Mm. <laughs> I mean, there's a way in which you could read it as a as a criticism of the whole logic of the Christian story, right? And re resurrection that yeah. demands some sort of suffering first. But I think she's she writes Christian poetry. So you don't read it like that. Yeah, I wasn't, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, feasting on thorns and liking it means you have to go through the hard part to get to the good part. So you appreciate the hard part. That's mm -hmm. pretty an amazing thing to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it. Feasting on the thorns is part of the, if she's writing, she's writing as a Christian, Christian voice. Feasting on thorns is part of the experience of uh, living the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's an odd ending. Yeah, because of the life. Yeah. She writes a lot of almost confessional poetry, but her, where her, the suffering examples that she gives are expanded into some sort of meaning for human suffering too and uh the gist of it is is that's uh we can't have life without suffering we can't learn without suffering i think is some of the themes that she's talked about in other poems we don't grow unless we suffer mm -hmm. I, I like that image of the, the towards the top bathing in the rainwater's glint like it was a mirror to some other universe where things were more acceptable easier mm -hmm. in the place i lived um, yeah. it's, it's almost like an envy a feeling of envy for what these beautiful birds can see that they represent another world mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. this, this world is not conclusion again yeah i love emily dickens she gets it right mm -hmm. <laughs> And the follow on, Susan, digging for some sort of elusive answer to the question I was presenting. Mm -hmm. Really? You know? And, and then the figure of maybe resurrection has something to do with it. That, it those, that progression of those three ideas is something to think about. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's really striking, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, do you, it's interesting how, how much later that later is, right? Um, it could be later that 
week or something but it seems more like it's like years later right because it's the year of the goldfinch mm -hmm. and she's looking back it mm -hmm. seems you know sh she's learned later mm -hmm. in her life mm -hmm. and and so it becomes this year of the goldfinch mm -hmm. um in the context of, of this new knowledge of their symbol uh, uh, as a resurrection symbol yeah. But the, the image, the question my curving figure made sounds like uh, this is, it sounds like somebody who's old. Ah. Except that she's young. Mm -hmm. Well, the point of view of the poem, I guess. Yeah. Well, certainly bent over digging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Huh. Well, it's a paradox, so there can't be a resurrection without a crucifixion. Mm -hmm. There can't be new life without death, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe she's talking about finding meaning in suffering. Now, there's an idea for you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm against that. There ought to be an easier way. <laughs> well, the whole thing. The whole thing of, you know, unless a seed falls into the earth and dies exactly. or becomes something else like a caterpillar to a butterfly sort of dies and becomes something else. Uh -huh. So that's, I mean, it, when she looks back at these birds, they have in this, in this poem alone, given her three different images of reality and something behind reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love her to call him two yellow winged twins. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody have goldfinches at your bird feeder? No. Mm. We don't see them too often. Yeah. We had a raft of them this year. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. But they're not the ones with the little red spots on their head. Those are in Europe. Guess we're all going to have to take a trip. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, doesn't mean that there has meaning in suffering. Is that too simple? No, that's very profound. Or maybe, maybe later you figure it was worth it even though you don't know it at the time. I mm -hmm. don't know. Um, it's the opposite of the idea that our suffering is meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the passage of time here in between the first part and the last four lines mm -hmm. is so important. The growth that happened there. Yeah, yeah. That's it took true. a long time, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I think there are things we learn about life that we would say, I never would have thought of that when I was a teenager, uh -huh. or I never would have thought of that. I had to live a while first, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Wonder if it's along that kind of line. Um, Makes me think a little bit about Glenna Seeley yesterday, mm -hmm. and her spiritual journey and all the very difficult things that she went through and. Mm -hmm. What a what beautiful suffering she went through. Person she is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she sees that threat of resurrection now in those moments, but she was pretty honest about the fact that living through some of those, she didn't feel it, right? Exactly. In the exactly. in the instant. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so welcomed her honesty and her her or clarity or, or artic she was so articulate about her suffering and what she went through. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. That one's on our YouTube page if anybody uh, wants to watch oh, it. Good. Yeah. All right, I gotta run pretty soon, friends. So let's get to this last one. Um, this is called Postscript. And sometime make the time to drive out west into County Clare along the flaggy shore in September or October when the wind and the light are working off each other 
so that the ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter, an inland among stones, the surface of a slate gray lake is lit by the earthed lightning of a flock of swans, their feathers roughed and ruffling, white on white, their fully grown headstrong looking heads tucked or cresting or busy underwater, useless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly. You are neither here nor there, a hurry through which known and strange things pass as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways and catch the heart off guard and blow it open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one. You recited that once in church, didn't you? I did, yeah, yeah. This is a great one to commit to memory. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. The images are wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the sometime make the time. Mm -hmm. Right. This was a, yeah, a poem he wrote, I think towards the end of his life. Uh, he'd yeah. already written um, quite a few wonderful famous poems, but I think this is my favorite of his poems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Useless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly. You are neither here nor there. Yeah, a hurry through which known and strange things pass. Would you say a little more about that? Yeah, it's funny we were just talking about age because I think I get a sense of not a particular age here, but, but lived experience, um, a relationship to time you know, that, that's been through a lot. Um, and maybe at a younger point, wanted to have experiences where they could park and capture it, right? Where you could stop time. Um, but now more of a openness to just letting life and experience kind of rush at you. Um, and, and so, so seeing this beautiful thing and not slowing down, right? Um, continuing and taking it at the speed at which it comes, um, which gives you the opportunity to have what happens in the last two lines happen where you, you, these rushes of the wind, you know, come at you. And um, I think that last line is re just really beautiful, right? Catch the heart off guard and blow it open. I think that's the line that made me remember that you had, when you said it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not many people hit a line, so hit, 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 hit a, a phrase, an expression, so well. Mm -hmm. And catch the heart off guard and blow it open. And blow it open. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's telling us that to my mind that we need to just be present where we are. Yeah. And yet he had to write it down and make this poem <laughs> for us, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> He's describing experience. His heart has been caught off guard and blown open. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nate, I like what you said about age, age and the passage of time being very present in this poem. And I feel like that what he he's describing in those last few lines is a gift of age. As you get older, it, that gets easier. You know, you don't feel like you need to pull off and get out your iPhone, you know, to take, to yeah. take a picture yeah. of this beautiful yeah. thing you saw. But just let it come through you. Yep. Yeah. Also, you might be a slightly worse driver. <laughs> 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 better not to stop right <laughs> <laughs> so is he describing in the the last four lines are just sort of intriguing when he talks about you're, you were neither here nor there a hurry through which known and strange things pass so hurry is almost being used as a noun you are a hurry Right, it is. Yeah. And you feel yeah. blowing through like soft buffetings. You know, just surprise. 
um, it's just interesting to hear it expressed that way. I think it's a, and so true. Sometimes you're going along, you know, Nate playing with your child or something, and suddenly there's just this moment where love blasts through you, or yeah. Mm -hmm. seeing a spark in a kid's eye and you think, ah, they connected the dots. Isn't that fun? <laughs> you know, all of those kinds of things. It's just, it's just, it's soft. It comes, it goes. You still have to stay present in the next moment after that. But you want to put a peg in it because it was special. Mm -hmm. You know, fleeting, but special. I'm just using you, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, Glenna, too, Glenna spoke to that really, really clearly. She gave some good examples of that. I want to go back and listen to her again. But she say, gave some really good times when she was just doing regular things. Mm -hmm. The spirit popped into right. into unbidden. Yes. With a message she paid attention to. Exactly. That was so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing I find interesting about this is, is the description of the swans is sor <laughs> sort of not what you expect. I mean, they seem a little sinister almost, you know, the feathers roughed and ruffling, you know, they're sort of a little disturbed, headstrong looking heads, um, busy underwater. I mean, you, uh, many times you see an image of a swan is like this sort of serene, thing that floats above the water but that's not the way these swans are well they're being buffeted too mm -hmm. that's right and they're also going about their own business yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they might be migrating mm -hmm. migrating mm -hmm. yeah. well the time of year yeah yeah mm -hmm. right right that would clear along the flame you would think they'd be late to migrate wouldn't you if they were in the fall yeah. That's a lovely poem because there's so much striking imagery of a scene. You think, well, this is a beautiful description of a scene. And mm -hmm. then it all comes together with those last lines, what this all means. Mm -hmm. so right, all... right. And uh, to go back to that Levertov poem, I mean, he gives you a sort of still life almost with yeah. lots of things moving. But then he said, it's almost like this meta moment where he says, actually don't take it as a still life. It's, it's better this way if you yourself keep moving through it. Mm -hmm. And that's the way in which you're, you're a hurry, like Susan said, mm -hmm. uh, strange usage of that mm -hmm. now. A hurry through which known and strange things pass. Known and strange both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing we notice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we're a hurry. <laughs> Yeah. I love the poem. Yeah. 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 Really beautiful. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Oh, is, uh, fun as usual. We'll we'll do it again sometime soon next month. Yeah. yeah. Stay okay. tuned. Good, good, good way to end the week. Yeah. 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 Really yeah. Really have, Thank you. Great to see Thank everybody. You, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.